Hello and welcome to another episode of Wired for Success TV. I'm Beryl Thomas and with me is my colleague Melanie Gabriel. Hello everyone. And today we have with us Susie Miller who describes herself as an, as an author, a speaker and a trainer. But she's really also a pioneer in the implementation of some cutting edge science to transform the lives of those labelled as autistic and the lives of their families and carers. Susie's training is conventional as a paediatric speech and language pathologist and yet a decidedly unconventional event whilst working with a four-year-old led her to a major paradigm shift in the way she viewed and worked with these children with neurodevelopmental issues. But even more than that, Susie awoke to how awesome each of us really is and what talents and gifts lie largely untapped within each of us. Her groundbreaking book, Awesomeism, a new way to understand the diagnosis of autism evolved from applying her unique skills to helping hundreds of families over many years. The book stimulated so much interest that Susie is now training others in her skills with her Global Awesomeism Training Certification Program. Today, Susie is going to share with us how she is making her own quantum leap by working with renowned scientist Dr. William Tiller of Stanford University to create the Autism Intention Experiment, an experiment that will work with consistent and coherent intention to support the integration of children diagnosed with autism. So, Susie, hello and welcome. Hello, thanks for having me here. It's fabulous that you could join us. Um, I first met you, oh, two, three years ago when you were making a flying visit to London and I was mesmerized by what you talked about. So I'm blessed to be have the, have the opportunity to catch up with you now. You have a lovely, lovely story of that um, experience you had with that young four-year-old. Would you share that with, with our audience today, Susie? Sure. Um, back in 1999, I was a pediatric speech-language pathologist in private practice in the state of Maine. And um, one of the children that was new to my caseload was a child that was diagnosed with autism. And I had not really worked with many children diagnosed with autism at that point. So it was going to be an adventure, you know, from the very beginning. I just didn't know how much of an adventure. But when I went to um, meet this child for the first time, he was in his daycare center, in his daycare school, and he was walking back and forth in the, in the kitchen, and he was saying, it's the millennium, it's 1999. And I thought, well, that's an interesting kid, you know, kind of. But what was more interesting is he came right up to me in the, in the kitchen, and he made direct eye contact with me, which I now, you know, we all now know is um, not very common, mm -hmm. but he made direct eye contact with me and um, he said, master. And when he said master, everything in my body went on high alert. It was like, it was like he saw something in me that I hadn't even seen myself. And it really, it, it made a huge impact. I took him back to a room in the back of the, the play school, and when we were in the back, um, I didn't really know what to do with him. Um, I was brand new to autism. I, you know, he was an interesting little kid and definitely did not want to be in that room with me. So I, I shut the door and I just sat down, behind, you know, I slid down beside the door. And I just thought, well, he's going to show me what he wants to show me. He'll show me what to do next was what was going through my mind. And he did, but again, not the way I thought he was going to. Um, he was walking around in the, in the room, and above him, I saw floating above him um, what appeared to be a, a light body version of him. So there was a light that looked just like his physical form, and there was a little tail that hung off of his foot, and it came right down into the top of his head and anchored into his heart space. And so I think I'm seeing things um, because <laughs> it, maybe I should go home. But I, so I said to myself in my head, I said, you know, I wonder what that is. You know, what am I seeing? And then I heard um, also within me, I heard that's my light body. 
you're here to help me integrate my light body into my physical body. And then I knew I should go home. Um, <laughs> so, so it got a little bit strange from there. But basically, in that moment, you know, things did change. My whole life changed in that moment. And I didn't really know how much in that moment. But the truth is, is that, you know, here was a child that was supposed to be disordered. You know, I was supposed to be coming there to quote unquote, fix this child and help him communicate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, number one, I'm seeing light floating above him. He's showing me himself as light, which begs the question, you know, what are all of us? And, and I, he had the ability to allow me to hear him um, without verbal language. So again, you know, what are we capable of? And that really did set a trajectory to asking an awful lot of questions, which unfolded and unfolded and unfolded to the point where he was able to provide me with a lot of information about just who these children actually are, what they're here doing, what's important to them and what's not important to them, and really where humanity is going um, just by the fact that they're here. So. So, Susie, this is fascinating, and it begs the question, how did he communicate that kind of information to you? Because I'm um, guessing a four-year-old wouldn't have had the kind of words. No, um, at the time, um, Riley was um, partially verbal, mainly nonverbal, and by partially verbal, I mean that he had some, like, one or two words at a time that he would say, like, but they would be they were meaningful, but they would also not necessarily fit the situation. Um, so he like, it's the millennium, it's 1999. He would say that, but what did that mean? You know, what did that mean in the context of, you know, that experience? It meant something to me right. and the word master meant something to me, but for anybody else hearing that, they would think, Oh, he's just uttering funny words. Like I thought when I first went in there, so the majority of our communication over the years was telepathic. Right. Just, just like it was on that first day when I asked, you know, what am I seeing? And he said, you know, that's my light body. So basically what would happen is I would ask him questions, um, sometimes verbally, sometimes just um, within my own mind. And he would respond to those telepathically. And then because I'm a speech language pathologist and because I want to check and balance everything, you know, that I receive, it didn't make sense to me to be able to be telepathic. So, sure. so every time he would give me something telepathic, I would take it back to him verbally and I would either write something down or I would ask him to choose this one or that one. I would try to give some kind of way in which I could validate for myself that the information that he had given me is true. And um, we were together for, well, we were together for over a year, but within that first year period, what was interesting is it got too cumbersome to keep going back and checking after a while because I knew I was accurate and I knew he was accurate. So after a while, I would simply just rely on the telepathy. It became validated enough in my own mind that I could rely on that. And every now and again, if I was curious or uncertain about what I was receiving, he'd let me know in one way or another that Susie, keep going, you know, you're, you're doing what a good an job. an awakening <laughs> just keep doing it. that must have been for you to start working. You use the word telepathy. That what probably wasn't a way of communication that was normal within your profession at that point? Not at all. <laughs> so, they, they, go on. I was just going to say they think you're a crazy person if you say <laughs> that you can telepathically communicate at the same time you're a speech language pathologist. So, But you obviously were getting good enough results. Yeah. That, so, so you felt like this was an okay path for you to continue on. It felt like it was the only path that I could continue on, quite frankly, um, because it it was one of those moments that where it changes your life so much, you know, you think you're heading down one avenue and you're doing what you're 
quote unquote, supposed to be doing, you know, that that's the right path for you. And then all of a sudden something picks you up like this and puts you on a completely different path. Mm. And for that reason, if nothing else, um, I'm very curious by nature. And so if nothing else, the curiosity was really getting me. And I had to keep going just a little bit further and a little bit further. And like I said, there were definitely times when I thought, you know, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to go back to being a regular speech language pathologist and pretend that didn't happen. But the fact is, is that every step along the way, something would happen to let me know that, that this was my path and that I was on the right track and I needed to keep going. And so, you know, here several years, over a decade later, and it's changed quite a bit. Um, yeah. Uh, so how so, did... Sorry. No, go on, Beryl. I was going to say, so how did writing the book um, take things to, to another level for you, Susie? Um, it was interesting because um, at the time the book was written, um, I was still a speech-language pathologist. And matter of fact, it was another speech-language pathologist that really encouraged me to write it. Um, and it was so interesting to me because, again, I didn't necessarily want to write it all down and that kind of thing. But I was so glad that I did because once the book was written, there was no publicity for it. I self-published that book. There mm -hmm. was, And yet, within about eight weeks, um, there was already somebody who wanted to publish it in Swedish. And so, you know, and people just started talking about it. And I think that the truth is, Beryl, that um, there were a lot of people that were having similar situations mm -hmm. or similar experiences at the same time that I did. But definitely parents were having those experiences with their kids where there was just a, there was an ability for them to be very intuitive with their children. But nobody was talking about that. And for parents especially, you know, their children are already different enough. If they start talking about being telepathic and all this other stuff with their children at the same time, that throws everything way out of kilter. Sure. So sure. The, the book really gave an opportunity for people, both parents and professionals, to become very well aware of the fact that there is this intuitive piece going on with the kids. And... I think that that's why it, it blossomed very quickly. People were already having those experiences. Now they had somebody who they considered to be a professional in this area, you know, validating that for them. So I think that that helped quite a bit. So these children, were they, what was so special about this kind of cohort of children? Um, the This particular um, diagnosis. You know, many of these children are nonverbal and yet, or limitedly verbal. And yet, the truth is, is that when you can telepathically communicate with them, they may be nonverbal, but that doesn't mean they're broken. Um, in my, from my vantage point, what it really means is that they have their focus and their, their primary, um, yeah, their primary focus somewhere else. So most of us focus our attention on our physical reality. Mm -hmm. We believe that we're physical human beings, and that's just about it. And some of us put our attention in our, into our mental capacity. You know, we think, therefore we are, kind mm -hmm. of experience. But the children diagnosed with autism are functioning more in that realm of what I would call spirit. So they are, they are aware of those experiences in that spiritual realm. They can see things that we can't see. They can hear and communicate with energies that we can't hear and communicate with. Um, they have access to information that is much more subtle than what most um, human beings are willing to access. And as I was having conversations with them through telepathy and beginning to learn some of the you know, what they're actually doing. You know, some of these children are abs well, they're all amazing, but some of them have very refined skills in things like a more of an energetic science 
or um, an energetic um, awareness that is much more subtle. They know things about us. They can help us move in ways that we wouldn't be able to move unless they were here. And again, if, if you've got an individual who is constantly has their focus, I, I always call it kind of being plugged into mm -hmm. spiritual realms, then the frequency of that alone, the energy of that alone is very different than being plugged into the mundane day in, day out life, um, the, the very dense um, perceptions of simply being human. And so the, the most interesting part to me is that many parents who have these types of children in their home they begin to change. They began to change the moment they were pregnant with this child. Their energy begins to change because these children are plugged in somewhere else. And if the parents will allow, they also will become very intuitive, very um, connected to higher parts of themselves. So I was simply taking the information the children were providing and giving that information back to the parents in a way that they could hear it Mm -hmm. So it take maybe baby steps at first, but then much bigger steps in, in shifting their awareness, not only about who their children are, but about who they are, you know, um, who we all are. And that's a huge shift, isn't it? Sorry, Melanie, I can see you're going to come in there. Off you go. No, I, I was merely wondering. <clears throat> so I can see how the parents would make a shift i'm just wondering about the other professionals around you unless they were having the kind of experiences you were having would you've been experiencing resistance um the most of the professionals that i initially met back in 1999 around this kind of topic telepathy again it was kind of like the parents you know you can't at that time you couldn't be a professional and have intuitive skills or if you had them you couldn't really have the conversation about it because in 1999 it wasn't what you talked about um, what's interesting is that since then many more professionals have come to the forefront a lot of professionals have stepped up and said you know I have these skills as a therapist or as an educator um, as an administrator, and I also have these skills, you know, in my intuition. So yes, initially there was a lot of resistance, but not necessarily because they didn't have that skill set. It was more, I think, because what the structure would allow or not mm -hmm. allow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as we've indicated, there's no way you can become exposed to this um, kind of thing where you're working with these essentially higher beings even though it might not look like it on the outside and not be transformed yourself and clearly it's taken you down a completely different path from perhaps what you thought you had planned <laughs> and I'm wondering how your path unfolded to the extent that you're now involved with, and we'll talk about this in a moment, this, this, the um, autism intention experiment with, with Dr. Tiller. How, how has the path sort of unfolded into this? Well, it, it very much went from, you know, me working with private clients, um, people finding out via the book that I um, did private consultations. I would work with families. I also worked with quite a few professionals. Um, were interested in a new way of, you know, looking at these kids. And so that began the journey, um, of course, helped. And then I began to teach, you know, kind of small groups of people, small classes. Um, I also began to offer messages from the children so that people could come and get more information and hear directly from their children. So I think that piece right there is one of the most important pieces because it's one thing to give people a bunch of information mm -hmm. about who children are. It's another thing to give an individual a very specific message from their child so that that parent knows that that child has, has the ability to connect mm -hmm. with me 
mm-hmm. others. So, so, ex- so it began, carry on. It began in that way. And then um, I began to have people who would ask me to teach them to do what I do or to teach them to... Um, to connect with the children in a higher way. And so I began to offer the awesomeism certification process. And that has grown amazingly in the last three years. We now have close to 50 certified practitioners and they're in 11 different countries. So, you know, that part to me is really exciting. You know, there's people all over the world that have a similar vantage point um, who are capable of connecting with these kids, you know, in a similar, if not greater way than I am. And it's, it's fascinating to watch. It's just fascinating to watch it go from 1999 when we won't talk about this, mm. 2012, where, you know, people can't get enough of being able to understand themselves more fully and understand these kids more fully. So. Mm. And I should I should imagine that in the process of these parents or educators wanting to be empowered to empower these these children, that they are learning unbelievable things about themselves. They're growing in unexpected ways. Yeah, I think it's interesting because many of the people that come to the certification process, sometimes they still come with the idea that they're going to be able to help this population or they're... Not, they're not so much in the, in the mindset that they're going to fix them, but they're definitely mm. in the mindset maybe that they somehow help this population. And uh, somewhere about halfway through the certification process, <laughs> they, this is about me, isn't it? And I go, yep. <laughs> so, yeah. And some people like that and some people don't, but it's, yeah. it's a lot of, there's a lot of self-awareness mixed into yeah. this process for sure. So unless you wanted to ask something, Beryl, I, I'm mm-hmm. curious now f- for you to give us a, a, a description of the, the experiment that you're doing with, with William Tiller. Mm. Yeah, the autism intention experiment um, manifested about months ago. I had a, inter- uh, a meeting with Dr. Tiller, kind of haphazard meeting, actually. I was in a group of people that he happened to be in. And um, we didn't have much conversation about it at all at that point. But afterwards, I met with him again in a smaller group. And he said, Susie, I really have been listening to what, you know, you've been saying about the children. I'm, I'm curious. You know, I believe that the children are part of this next epoch. I believe that they're bringing in a certain level of consciousness and that that level of consciousness hasn't been able to get fully grounded here yet. Um, And yet I think that they're a very important population. I've never heard a scientist or anybody else really say that, um, which is exactly what I believe to be true as well and have heard from the children for a long time. So Dr. Tiller has over 40 years of experience with um, intention experiments. So he went from being a Stanford-based, you know, professor, um, rigorous science, really. Uh, and he began to become interested in intention and what can intention actually do. And so through his experiments, he's proven over the last 40 years that, that human intention and human coherent intention can have a, an amazing impact on physical reality. So current science believes that the the human, the physical condition, um, can't really change anything, can't change anything, you know, and they, to the point where they sometimes will believe that they can't impact their own experiment just by watching them, you know, and it's just been now with quantum physics where we're beginning to see, oh, there is an impact, that they're having to re- rethink these ideas. Dr. Tiller on the other end of that spectrum where he's saying we all affect our realities. We all affect um, through our intention what we experience. And so he has done a few experiments where 
they were able to set it a coherent intention, project this intention into a space. So they basically are, they have an intention device, they are scrolling names through a computer that have an address in them. That information, that intention is then broadcast to that space. They did this with two different clinics and the clinics were both working with people who had anxiety and depression. And so they, they broadcast it to one and not the other. And lo and behold, the, the individuals that were receiving treatment from that center, from that clinic, on depression and anxiety got better. They felt wonderful. Their, their mood changed. They also projected an intention um, for the pH of water. Okay, so, you know, mm -hmm. just what? And the interesting thing is this water happened to be in Berlin when Dr. Tiller and his team were in Payson, Arizona. So they were able to increase the pH of water by a certain percentage just by setting the intention. They were also able to decrease the pH of water by setting a certain intention. And this is across 3,000 miles. So obviously time and space have no um, real limitation in this. Um, so what Dr. Tiller and I were interested in is we were interested in supporting families of children diagnosed with autism. So is it possible for us to be able to set a clear, coherent intention that these children come into what Dr. Tiller calls bio body suits, uh, that they integrate into themselves, into their physical bodies um, with ease and grace, and most importantly, according to their soul's purpose. So one of the things that has been really important to me over the whole stretch of my connection with these children is that, is that they come here when they're ready to come here. And they come here in a way that certs, um, suits their soul's purpose. I've seen many children over the years who have been taught to be more socially acceptable. But they ought to be that really uh, to the, at the deterrent of their own souls. You know, they, it's kind of like they lost something. They lost that spark. Um, to come here and I also worked with children who have come to me telepathically or come to me and said I want to be fully present and they've I've taken them through those steps and they show up and they're fully present they're in their bodies they're connected everything but that was because it was their choice mm -hmm. mm. decided they or their teacher decided that they had to be okay so this piece about coming in according to their soul's purpose, really important for me. And when Dr. Tiller said that, I was, I was hooked. I was like, you're the man for me. I can do this. Um, and so basically the, the intention experiment will, will support just that. It will support these children being able to integrate into their physical bodies. Tiller has also been wonderful in the fact that he's allowing me to hear the collective consciousness of the children, find out exactly what the children want, tell him what they want, and then he creates the intention. I mean, he, and he um, creates the intention around that. So this isn't a haphazard intention that some adults or some scientists or some educators are deciding that we're going to impede upon these children. This is the collective consciousness of these children saying, this is what we would like, and passing it on to him. So they actually wanted that intention to be twofold. They wanted an intention for themselves so that they could integrate into this time-space reality according to their soul's purpose. And they also wanted an intention for their parents so that their parents would have ease and grace in allowing this process. Because we all know it's one thing for somebody to show up differently. It's another thing for somebody 
who loves them to be able mm-hmm. to see them and know that. So they've intended it to be two twofold. So to summarize, there are a group of children who've committed to this experiment. You read from their collective unconscious what they need. You, in a sense, translate this for Dr. Tiller, who then sets up the right broadcast, which impacts on them as well as their parents. Yes, it's um, kind of. I'll make one correction in that the collective consciousness of the children, all children diagnosed with autism and other energetic sensitivities are the group of individuals, no, not individuals, the the soul group, if you will, Mm -hmm. that this information. We also have, we already have close to 50 people who are registered for this experiment, which will begin um, by the end of November. And those children uh, will participate in this based on the intention of the collective consciousness of the children. So once this intention is set, it will be the same intention will be broadcast um, to these children's homes for a year long period. The other piece for me about it taking place over a year long period is it also gives children the opportunity again to integrate according to their Mm -hmm. soul's purpose, according to their own timing. So if you have a year to do that, you can you can do that in the way that's right for you. And if it's right for you to come completely into your physical body and be present and accounted for and and come with all of your gifts, then you have that window of opportunity to do that. If it's meant for you to maybe become a little bit more verbal or a little less uncomfortable in your physical body, you may do that. But but again, according to the children's full purpose, not according to what we necessarily want to ha- happen for them. Mm, mm. If this is successful, Susie, the implications of this are phenomenal, aren't they? They're way beyond working with, with children with, with these kinds of issues. As you said, Dr. Tiller has already done work with those with uh, emotional issues, anxiety and depression. Um, How does Dr. Tiller feel like this is going to um, uh, impact science? Because we know that there's, there are kind of, there's, there's, you kind of Bruce Lipton, Greg Braden kind of scientists, Dr. Tiller kind of scientists, then 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 there are the others. Just, and I know that many of you are working very hard to, to, to educate the others. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, mainstream science may or may not jump on board. Who knows? Um, but the bottom line is, is that when, number one, you, we've, we're working with a population, parents of children diagnosed with autism, are about the most tenacious population I've ever met. I mean, they just, if something works for their child, there will be nobody who will be able to mm. stop them talking mm. about that. So there's that vantage point of it. Um, and you're right, you know, Dr. Bruce Lipton, Greg Braden, they're doing amazing things in shifting the awareness of science, Dr. Tiller. And yet, I think that in Dr. Tiller's case, Because he did have that rigorous scientific background from Stanford, he's very well respected in the, um, you know, in the mainstream as well. I think that he may have the opportunity to really bridge this gap, or if nothing else, he's going to cause there to be a lot of question in mainstream science as to, you know, what does really uh, what what does consciousness really mean? What does intention really do? And if nothing else, it will have that impact. But Dr. Killer and I are also both looking at this from the vantage point that we really can support a population of children who, in our minds, it, they're part of this next epoch. They are bringing a new level of consciousness and they may not fully be able to anchor it here yet or have not been able to anchor it here yet. But um, I personally believe that that's getting ready to happen. 
So this has implications for these families, has implications for science, it has implications for humanity and how we perceive ourselves, and it also has implications for, for other quote unquote conditions because mm. autism is probably the big con condition. You know, it's it's the diagnosis of the decade, so to mm. speak. And so if that can be impacted by intention, what else can be impacted? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so can I talk to you about that for a moment? It's uh, what I'm what it sounds to me like what's coming to my head is maybe these children are here to teach us more about our own power because what you're really saying is the intention can affect matter thought can affect matter and that's what we're all having to wake up to there's all this the secret law of attraction uh, yeah that that doesn't work for everybody but i know you've talked to us before in a previous conversation about coherence of intention could you just say a little bit about that because i found that fascinating yeah the um this actually comes directly from dr tiller we were having this conversation one day um intention because for instance, like within the certified practitioners, we can take, I, I can take the group of certified practitioners and we can set an intention for a child to be supported, you know, coherent. Mm. Um, and that child will change. But the reason that that child changes is because we have a small group of individuals who all have the same ideas about the same things we have a group of individuals who've worked very diligently to clear out any of their own baggage so that they don't get their own stuff in the way. Mm -hmm. And that's that creates a more coherent frequency. So, so let's take that small group. That's a coherent choice, okay? Coherent intention to support a child. So let's take all the parents, all the educators, everybody who works with children with autism. And if we were to say, okay, we want you to support this child diagnosed with autism, they would all also probably, you know, want to be supportive of that child, but they may have fear, mm -hmm. they may have fear, they may have doubt, they may see the child's limitation instead of their brilliance. And so now you have all of this attention put on something. The intention is there and the attention is there, but the intention is not coherent mm. because all of these different people having all of these different ideas about what's possible. So, so it, it dilutes it. And quite frankly, sometimes for children who are as energetically sensitive as this population is, if we did take a thousand people, say, and say, let's just make autism easier. Let's make it easier for autism. It might actually make it a little bit more challenging because these kids are so sensitive to feeling the energies of other people that they're going to be feeling all of that. Whereas if we narrow that down and we say, okay, here's a small group of individuals who have done that piece of work and who are holding that coherent intention that can create something um, big in a very small space. Now take it down to the intention experiment. Now take it down to Dr. a coherent intention that is held in a device. The device holds the coherence. The, the device actually creates a change in the environment, a change in the space, so that the children have of what is available to them in the physical. Now, that becomes a very precise, coherent mm -hmm. intention. When that's broadcast, who knows what's possible? So we're just, it's like refining it, refining it, refining it. So in terms of frequencies, it's like it's holding it very, very pure and very clean, isn't it? So that you don't get all these interferences. That's right. That's right. And if that can be broadcast into the physical space of a family, a parent and a child, then you can imagine, um, you can imagine that the, the child will have access to all the dimensions 
that they need to have access to in order to come into themselves. One of the things that we've also noticed as we've just been talking about this experiment is this is this is more in some ways it's more complicated than um, than simply coming into the body because these children their energetic systems are very refined and function at a very high frequency. So as you're you, as you're push as you're twisting that into the physical body as you're integrating that into the physical body, there are physical body changes that need to occur. Oh. There are changes that need to occur, mental body changes, different dimensional body changes. And I, I visualize it as, you know, kind of like those nesting eggs. Something has to come into, come into coherence and then it clicks down to the next level. Mm. Come, let's click down into the next level. So it's also the reason why this doesn't take place overnight. That's why it, we're doing this over a year long period of time. So just to be clear, for people who are not familiar with this kind of talk, okay, because there will be some, uh, some of our audience will not be familiar with this talk, but interested, I'm sure. Um, I'm, I mean, Mary and I are both familiar with bioresonance, so we get this, but there's going to be no receptor as such in the home. The children, the the occupants of that home are the receptors themselves, aren't they? This is broadcast through a piece of technology that Dr. William has worked with, Dr. William Tiller has worked with, has developed. It's broadcast from that, from intention, and it's just going out over the airways like wireless, and there's no receptor apart from the physical beings themselves. The, actually, the, re, the receptor is the space, not even the physical beings. The, the space is going to be conditioned so that whatever is possible that can happen within that space will happen and i'll give you a, i'll give you a, a perfect example i went to dr tiller's home recently and i had we had met several times but never in his physical space mm. I walked into his physical space and i said wow this really feels so clear and i and i'm energetically sensitive so you know i could pick it up but but what was interesting is he kind of smiled and he said, it's a conditioned space. And I said, interesting, because what I'm noticing about myself in this conditioned space is that I have access to information that I don't typically get. Mm -hmm. And I have one degree of information that I have available, but I was getting different information. And the more that we sat in that conditioned space and had a conversation, the broader my the broader that information could be and not only the broader that information could be but the more i in my in my scenario the easier it was for me to articulate that information so mm. great for me to have that experience myself because i can imagine now what it might be like for the children in that space so if their space allows them to go as far out as they need to go, but also to bring that back in, it's like, to, I imagine it almost as an expansion and contraction um, mm -hmm. that is allowed. But the way our space is now, the way the frequency of most people's homes spaces are now, you know, these kids can function out in those higher dimensional realms, but when they try to bring that in, just like when I mm -hmm. tried the concept of telepathy to speech language mm -hmm. pathologist in 99, it hits a wall. You know, there's, it's like it gets to that place and there's nowhere else for it to go until there is, you know, until that begins to soften a bit. So mm -hmm. in this scenario, I believe that we're going to have a nice fluid movement um, throughout dimensions and if that's the case I believe that these children will be able to integrate beautifully so exciting it is exciting, it's exciting. really pick up on your passion with this Susie you're clearly a changed woman in these last 12 or 13 years and and actually just listening to how you're describing how in that space you 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 felt a lot more articulate and a, a lot more able to 
tune into information um, that perhaps wasn't available to you. The thoughts coming to mind, if you've got, I, I think you, you're, you're aiming to have 100 families in mm -hmm. this experiment. So if you have 100 families doing this experiment, this, this is going to spill out beyond them and have an impact on others who are, mm -hmm. may, not, may not be deliberately doing that experiment. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, taking, taking from your, your description of how you are able to articulate differently, more eloquently, it sounds as though what this space is going to do is enable us to, to craft a more sophisticated language to, to deal with or express this whole process. Well, I think if nothing else, it will give the children the opportunity to have their own voice, you know, in the they've had their voice through people who can telepathically communicate with them or through other forms of communication. If this, it, this will bring about that ability for them to have their own voice. And if that mm -hmm. takes place, um, we're going to be learning a lot very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm. We're all shifting our perceptual reality, um, much like I had the opportunity to do in 99. And when you have a lot of people that begin to see any population differently, you, they can't help but see themselves differently. You know, they'll be asking new questions. And I think nothing else, that is huge because mm. you know, we receive what we ask questions about. We... And the minute that we start asking new ones, um, you know, really, who are these children really? I mean, there's one in 88, one in 66 kids. They're coming in droves. Why? You know, and mm. an answer to that. But I would much rather these kids give you that answer. Yeah. And I think about where we're getting ready to, um, to be, which is amazing. So. Mm. This is a fantastic conversation it's stimulating all kinds of other things in my mind <laughs> that we need to come back and talk to you about another time Susie because it's a fascinating topic and I just want to say thank you for doing this work because it can't have been an easy journey I understand that you heard that it was it was the only journey you could take eventually but it it must have had its challenges along the way for you personally it did, <laughs> yeah. But I think that anybody who anybody who follows their passion, uh, the idea that you're going to follow that passion and there's not going to be any bumps in the road. <laughs> We're finding that out, Susie. <laughs> We're finding that out for ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> having said that, having said that, what you're creating seems to be creating a straighter, less bumpy path for others to follow. Yes, you're a way shower. So. Okay, Susie, yeah. well, we're mindful of your time and we know you're dashing off to have a, a chat with the wonderful Dr. William Tiller. Um, we're very envious of you spending time with him. He's one of our heroes here. Um, and, Susie, and it, sorry. No, carry on, carry on. I was going to say, Susie, how can, how can um, families get onto your program? Yes, um, you will need to pre-register. People will need to pre-register. They'll need to pre-register by the end of November. And um, they can go to suzymiller.com, and I'm S-U-Z-Y-M-I-L-L-E-R.com. And there's a picture of Dr. Tiller right on my home page. Click it, and it'll take you right to the pre-registration page. Um, but do pre-register, have people do pre-register before the end of November because we are going to get started with or without 100 people um, by the end of November. Dr. Tiller called me just a little while ago and said that we're ready to get started regardless. So um, he wants to move on with it. So I'm excited. Mm. Okay. And people want to buy your book. It's on Amazon, presumably. Awesome -ism is on Amazon. Exactly. Awesomeism is on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a mouthful. And if they want to find out more about your training program, they come directly to your website. The website, um, we have a couple different things. We have, there's a programs tab on the left-hand bar and a certification tab. 
some people may not be ready or want to quite yet do the certification process. Um, that's kind of more of a commitment than anything. And so there are some programs that are available. There's a free one there as well. So download the free one mm. for sure. And um, Awesomeism 1 is free. Awesomeism 2 and 3 are programs that parents and professionals might like. And then the certification process, there's certification process uh, level one, um, which is open to everybody as well. So, And if people just want to chat with you, you're available on Facebook? I am on Facebook. Um, awesomeism, um, there's an Awesomeism Facebook page. It says Awesomeism Susie Miller. Um, I also have a radio show called Pure Presence, and they can go to the Pure Presence Facebook page as well. So. And you're on Twitter too? I'm on Twitter too. So, Blue so Star, I think it's Twitter. Please. Okay, we'll put all the links at the bottom of this. And will you come back and um, answer comments that come up on our blog page after this? I would love to. That would be great. That would be great. Thanks for having me. It's been well, we've been great to have you. It's Thank been you for delightful. spending the time. Thank you yeah. so much. So before we complete, we, we end this, just a word to our audience to subscribe to our awesome blog for more information. That's at wiredforsuccess.tv. Please also, as Beryl has mentioned, feel free to comment to this on this um, episode. Check out our social media um, on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. And if you've been inspired by by today's episode and you'd like to share a story we'd love to hear from you so um, please say goodbye ladies goodbye to the audience and we're looking forward to bringing you another episode so bye thank all thank you bye Susie